Welcome. Um, for those who just joined, I'll share again. I'm Lauren Johnson, Executive Director of SVP Social Venture Partners Portland. Um, and for those who don't know, SVP is a community of professionals who collectively invest time and money and influence to help build community capacity to solve intractable problems. Our current focus is ensuring equitable access to quality, culturally relevant preschool. As a partnership of venture philanthropists, whom we call SVP partners, we seek investment opportunities in early stage ideas or initiatives like Preschool for All here in Multnomah County, with whom we form deep multi-year partnerships to help them realize their vision for impact. We often serve in the role of incubator for startups, a neutral convener, a catalyst for collective action, as well as a seed investor. Uh, SVP initiated this research project after hearing uh, from our county, uh, as well as our local early learning hub, that it would be helpful both to preserve the original intent of the Preschool for All program framework, as well as to share with other communities who have been reaching out to learn about our success here in Multnomah County. So we formed a team of SVP partners to guide the research project, um, provided a seed grant, and raised additional funds in order to hire Dialogues in Action to, read the, to, to lead the research. We also convened an advisory team to whom we are very grateful for contributing their time and expertise. They help to make sure the report, as well as other materials produced, are truly reflective of the community's experience during the Preschool for All policy development process and useful to other communities seeking to engage in community-based participatory policy development. Today, we are excited to be here with you all to share more about the findings and insights from the report. So first, I wanna thank uh, the other participants who are joining me in leading the call. We have with us uh, Commissioner Jessica Viga-Peterson. We have Dialogues in Action. Uh, and we also have Lydia Gray Holyfield, uh, a parent from the campaign. campaign excuse me. I also wanna thank uh, the sponsors who made the research possible. So this includes PNC Bank, Oregon Community Foundation, Foundations for a Better Oregon, the Ford Family Foundation, and Kaiser Permanente, all of whom joined SVP Portland in funding this project. And finally, I want to thank the project advisory team who joined us from Multnomah County, the Children's Institute, Coalition of Communities of Color, the Early Learning Council, Early Learning Multnomah, Children's Funding Project, Oregon Community Foundation, and Ford Family Foundation. So over the, the course of the next hour, our commissioner will begin with an introduction. Dialogues in Action will then share research and some commentary, and uh, a parent will provide her perspective on the research. We will then open up for Q&A uh, and wrap at the end of the hour. If you have questions, um, please type them in the chat box uh, during the presentation. Uh, I will be reviewing them along with my colleague Rose, who is here uh, with us today, um, and then we'll get to them during the Q&A. So with that, I will turn it over to the commissioner. Thank you so much, Lauren, um, for um, being our uh, facilitator for this great meeting. It's so wonderful to see so many people um, join in as we're at this really exciting point of releasing the report. Um, it's great to see that there's so many, so much interest both in our community and, and nationally on what we've done here in Multnomah County with Preschool for All. Um, my name is Jessica Vega Peterson. I use she, her pronouns. I'm the Multnomah County Commissioner. Um, I had the honor of being the um, chair of the Preschool for All Task Force and one of the co-chairs of the Preschool for All campaign. Um, so um, this, the work that we did here in, um, uh, in, in Multnomah County to, to pass this measure and, and to get this policy in place was years of work. And I just wanted to thank um, you, Lauren, personally, but also Social Venture Partners for being such incredible um, leaders and deep and, and sharing such deep partnership every step of the way with Preschool for All, including all the work that went into creating this report that we're here to talk about today. Um, 
I also want to thank Dialogues in Action for their incredible work in putting together this research and really being um, partners and, and their curiosity in taking on this project. Um, and also for the like 44 people at least who participated in interviews um, to make this report happen. We um, thought it was important. This is this, having a report like this is something that we talked about from the very, very early days of the um, of the preschool for all task force, because we knew what we were doing as a community coming together to talk about what universal preschool could look like, what preschool would look like um, if every child had a preschool that was right for them and every family could afford it. Um, we knew that that was something very special, and we knew that it was special because of the ways that we were going about it in really um, bringing community together. So not just having the usual suspects at the table um, of, of you know, early learning experts and business and health, but having parent voice at the table, having worker voice at the table, having provider voice at the table, right? To really make sure that the work we were doing um, was gonna be impactful and it was gonna be the right work to serve our community and to really create this vision that was gonna work in the real way. Um, and we also were able to do it and carry that kind of work um, through to the campaign and leading a campaign that was inclusive, that um, had people who were at the table have power in making decisions that wasn't tied to money. Um, we really wanted to make sure that the work we did were built on a process that was inclusive, that centered race, and, um, and that really centered children in how we were putting this together. And I think that is apparent um, in the way that we were able to get such huge community um, support. Um, and we want to make sure that the work that we did and what we were able to accomplish here is something that other communities across the nation can look at, can learn from. We wanna share it so that this victory that we had isn't the only victory, but will lead to more and more victories, um, both for investments in children, but in other policies as well because it's not just about winning, it's not just about putting a policy in place, but it's about having community guide the policy making and do it in a way that centers equity and having people feel that they are investive and have ownership in both the policy and the campaigns that happens. So we, what I wanna make sure is that we are going to be able to take this as a way of creating policy um, and making sure that that spreads. I think there are a lot of conversations happening now about what universal preschool and what child care investment can look like nationally. There have been a lot of conversations that, um, that I've been a part of if people are contemplating that. And I think that this, um, the timing of this report couldn't be better in terms of having an influence on those conversations and saying, if we are going to make this kind of investment as a nation, this is the way that we should do it. This is the way that community should be involved in this process. This is the way that, um, that this should happen to make sure that it is truly something that is happening for children, for families, for workers, and not just done to, to them. Um, so I'm really excited, um, again, to have so many folks on this call and to have so many people um, interested in learning what we did. Now I have the pleasure of introducing Dialogues in Action, who, as I said, were just incredible partners in creating this um, really bringing their expertise to the research here to make sure that that was also a community-based process. Um, they did incredible work as well as incredible work that was done by our two community-based interviewers who worked with Dialogue in Action, Mary Edder Kellyer wells from Self Enhancement Inc. and Abigail Mendez at Latino Network. I also wanted to thank Megan Irwin. Um, Megan has been a part of Preschool for All since the earliest task force days. Um, she was the policy, in, um, a policy facilitator for the Preschool for All Task Force, and she also provided some um, guidance to the research team as they took on this work. So just so many people to thank as a part of this process, but now I'm very happy to turn it over to Dialogues in Action. Hi, good morning or good afternoon to um, everybody on this call. First, uh, we just wanted to say a huge thank you um, to you, Commissioner, uh, both for that lovely introduction, as well as um, for all of the support that, that you've provided us um, during this process from beginning to now end, um, as well as all of your team um, who have been also wonderful in this process. Um, we also wanted to, to give a big thank you um, to the SVP team who, who really have uh, supported and, and guided us through a lot of this process, as well as everybody else who participated in interviews, um, sometimes multiple, uh, who gave us really important information and background, um, and who just devoted a lot of, of time and energy and resource and, into helping um, this report come together. 
Um, so really grateful for all of you and, and everybody who um, who helped along that journey, as well as the, the folks that maybe um, we haven't gotten a chance to see yet and are getting to see and meet today. Um, thank you all for, for being here as well. Um, before we jump into kind of the, um, the meat and potatoes of this, uh, I did want to do um, a, a quick introduction of, of the individuals on our team today who um, who you know really did a lot of this work um, and, and will be kind of also guiding this presentation. Um, so to get started, I'll introduce myself. My name is Nika Tahan. Um, I am a consultant with uh, Dialogues in Action, um, and I was uh, privileged enough to, to be able to do um, some of the research interviews and, and development of, of, this, uh, of this project and report. Erin, I don't know if you would like to introduce yourself now. Sure, thanks Nika. Hi, I'm Erin Upton. I am Associate Consultant with Dialogues in Action and I too had the great privilege of getting to work on this project and um, conduct a number of interviews as well as work on um, some writing. So I look forward to sharing with you more today. Thanks. And I'm Steve Patty and I'm happy to be here with you as well. We were just going to share with you a couple of highlights of some of the things that we learned through the interviews and uh, some of the analysis of the interviews. We're looking forward to sharing that with you. Lovely. Okay. So um, I am going to be sharing my screen now. Um, hopefully everything works on the Zoom front. Um, always the moment of truth. Okay, great. Um, also, just before we, we really jump into things, um, as Steve mentioned, uh, this is really kind of um, uh, an overview and a, and a highlight of some of the really um, you know, what we found to be really important themes and findings um, of the research. So although you might see a few more points listed um, <laughs> on a slide, um, we, we might not go super in depth into, into every single point. Um, and hopefully all of you have uh, access to the full report as well as, as the executive summary um, and a few other um, kind of infographics and things that'll that'll allow you to dive a little bit deeper if you have interest, as well as um, I know has already been said, if you have any questions, uh, please feel free to ask those in the chat box. Uh, so just to get started on things, um, you know, uh, we really used these two kind of focus questions uh, to guide our, our research and to guide this report. Um, so the first is, what were the important elements of the policy development process? And then the second was, what were the critical elements and tactical steps of the grassroots and equity-centered policy making? Um, so again, kind of looking at, at, at what were some of these pathways to success? How, how did this kind of successful campaign come to be? Um, and what were the really important elements of having it be rooted in community um, and especially in a racial equity kind of centered in lens? To dive a little bit into some of the methodology and give you an overview of that, um, we did use some artifact analysis. So, um, Again, a, a lot of folks were, were really helpful in, in providing us with everything from um, the policy measure itself to committee notes to social media postings um, to better understand and have a good background of, of everything that kind of came into play um, and to give a good sense of history and context of, of what this policy and measure was and, and, and how it came to be and how it came to be um, successfully passed. Um, we did semi-structured interviews with about 44 different stakeholders. Um, again, these interviews um, were, were done with um, kind of a values-based approach. We wanted them to be as participatory as possible, um, you know, still, still rooted in, in strong methodology, um, but also wanted to ensure that folks were able to really express their experience, understanding, and overall narrative um, of, of the process and the project. And then finally, participatory sense making. Um, so we were lucky enough um, to be able to, to kind of come back with all of the findings that we had from, from the first two steps of this process, um, meet again with folks who were involved, meet with community members, meet with parents, um, and, and ensure that we were fully understanding some of the themes that were coming up from that perspective, um, as well as to co-create 
um, some, of, some of the findings um, as well. So in terms of the findings, um, we were able to, to kind of recognize six key components um, that, that really contributed to the success of the Preschool for All initiative. Um, here we call those components the pathways to success. Um, the idea being, you know, this, this is really the, the guide um, that kind of led and moved this, um, this initiative to where we find it today um, into the implementation uh, phase, which is which is extremely exciting. Um, also, potentially as a guide map for other folks who might be interested, um, you know, in passing potentially early learning um, education policy and or doing this type of policy work in other areas. Um, so here you'll see kind of our six pathways to success. Um, don't worry about writing all of these down or, 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 or uh, capturing all of this in this slide. And we'll be going through each of these kind of um, briefly as we move on. So I'll jump in and share with you the first few findings of our Pathways to Success um, highlighted in the report. And one of the first ones is finding shared values. And Commissioner Vega Peter Peterson already referenced a number of these. Um, but we found that values were really grounded and they were the center of this work for the initiative and a very critical feature in Pathways to Success for the campaign. Um, so I'm going to highlight four of these values. And again, Commissioner Vega Peterson referenced these as well. So placing children at the center of community was really critical shared value for partners and community members and stakeholders who participated in this initiative, as well as ensuring racial equity and inclusion was core to the success of the initiative. Providing access for all, so ensuring universal access to high quality preschool for all children was a shared value in this initiative, as well as valuing the early learning professionals. So it was essential for um, the teachers, the assistants, and the other support staff to have a voice and to be um, valued and highlighted in the, the process as well. Our second component that was revealed in the research was um, laying the foundation. So this work was going on for a number of years, um, nearly a decade in order to establish a very solid foundation of um, community participants, participation, and collaboration. And so I'll highlight a few key aspects from the foundation building of the project. So one was building on existing community work. So, so many people in the community had been working for a number of years on some very um, important discoveries, understandings, and work that was being done in the early childhood education realm, as well as in the racial justice domain. Um, within the Lane of Foundation, there was also creating new partnerships um, to be able to highlight and include a broad range of community voices. Um, in addition to the new partnerships, it was also support to build existing relationships and continue to move those forward, for example, through community-based organizations. Forming coalitions. So the organizers of the Preschool for All initiatives, we found did an excellent job of bringing together multiple groups to unite in an individual, um, to unite individual efforts into one initiative going forward. And it was important to gather input and data from key informants. And so relative, relevant information was critical for creating policy that was going to be achievable going forward in a real world setting. It was also important to set the stakeholder table and engage the whole community. And one of the major strengths of the Preschool for All initiative and the Up Now efforts was a commitment to bring people together with um, empowered voices and mutual respect. And we found that there were two primary types of participant groups um, as part of this initiative. One was we called community frontliners. And so this included parents of children, the BIPOC community participants, 
early childhood teachers and assistants and educators, volunteers and union members. And in addition to the community frontliners, there was also an important group of leaders from public, private and philanthropic sectors, a number of whom uh, from both of these groups are here today um, that we can hear more from. So this included county commissioners, public sector education leaders, private sector leaders and others. Great, thank you so much, Yaren. Um, so getting into the, the last kind of half of, of our pathways to success, we have navigating the human dynamic. Um, and this we just found, um, you know, over and over and over again was so essential. Um, and, you know, I think a really good kind of perspective of this actually comes from um, one of the folks that we interviewed who said, I can't emphasize enough the importance of relationship building and authentic listening and going to communities where they are, literally, it is the relational piece. Um, and I think that that just really highlights um, kind of the importance of this. So here we found that within navigating the human dynamic, um, you know, we had convening people and facilitating collaboration, navigating language and linguistic barriers, mediating cross-sector dif differences, um, maneuvering through power dynamics. This came up a lot um, in, in the interviews that, that, that we were, um, you know, that we, that we conducted. Um, you know, when, when, uh, when folks are attempting to do this type of process and this type of policy work, um, dynamics that, that we see already in society often come up and are at play um, um, within this kind of microcosm. And so, you know, we see things like, um, uh, for instance, gender dynamics, right? Um, so uh, again, a really good quote from somebody um, um, that we interviewed was, the underfunding of a child of childcare is a feminist issue. It's part of the general marginalization of care labor and work that's thought of as feminine and underappreciated, right? So we had kind of these, you see these other issues, these other social issues coming up that also had to be navigated really skillfully for this to be successful. Um, next, we found that securing resources um, and resources kind of in the broad understanding of resource and capital, so financial, political, informational, and social, were all equally important investments into this being the success that it was. Um, you know, again, just to highlight, um, you know, I think we oftentimes think of, of financial capital as, as kind of the, the main source, the main kind of investment that's needed. Um, but as we've already seen here, um, you know, the, the political capital was just as, if not more important, with as much risk, right? When we think of investment, we often also think of risk of, of losing funds, but there were other risk um, kind of elements at stake, um, including reputation and, and you know, political um, importance. Uh, another key component was the informational capital. Um, and I do just want to highlight this um, because I think that this is something that oftentimes can get overlooked when we're looking at all different types of resource um, investment, um, especially um, because everybody has information and knowledge that they can provide. And I think that this is really essential also when we're looking at the other pathways to success, looking at how to engage values, um, how to maneuver through different dynamics is understanding that everybody comes with informational capital. Um, another thing that I think is really interesting to note, and this actually came from a community member um, when we were going through um, our sense-making session, was that we, we oftentimes think that um, people also hold kind of uh, one mastery, right? So you have a community member and so they have informational capital about the community. Um, she pointed out that they also oftentimes hold other positions. So when we think of community members, they're not just community members. They are also teachers, um, parents, doctors, researchers themselves, and vice versa. When we have a researcher, oftentimes they're also a parent, um, right? They're also a part of the community. So thinking about where those things intersect and interlap was, was really interesting as well. Um, social capital, of course, I think this is a big topic that, that comes up generally these days, um, and, and of course was, was quite present um, in this process as well. So our last kind of major pathway to success was adapting along the way. Um, and, you know, I'm sure, sure we can all <laughs> think back to, to what these past now over years, almost two years 
um, have been like, um, you know, especially with, with COVID going on. And, and again, I'll just highlight um, what, what one of our participants said, which is COVID may have also done us all a favor by highlighting the needs because all of a sudden everybody came home, right? So when everybody was home, everybody realized, wow, we really do need childcare. What is it like for folks that traditionally don't have childcare systems that do have kids, um, you know, and, and maybe don't have uh, private places to send them and, and need that childcare while they're working, right? I think it became um, a much more um, universal understanding of the need for these types of resources and the need for, um, you know, really quality early childhood education. Um, also wanted to highlight, there was obviously a uh, uh, some some racial justice protests and, and unrest going on as well, um, and and figuring out how to utilize that. This is also an issue of racial justice, um, and so being able to figure out how to fit into that conversation was also essential and crucial. Steve, would you like to take it from here? As you might imagine, with all of this data and um, these conversations, there was so much learning in the midst of, of, of it all. Um, if, if you have the chance to read the report, we, we identified four key lessons uh, to be um, taken from this process. Uh, there are more than that embedded in the narrative. You'll be able to see that. But there are, there, there are 14. I'd just like to highlight four of them before we, um, before we, we have deeper conversations about this. Um, it was really critical all along the way to have skilled conveners. There's so many pieces, so many aspects, so many elements, so many dynamics, so much to overcome, so many pivots all along the way. And, um, and, and, and since uh, it, 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 the, the progress required coalitions and alliances of people getting together, thinking together, having a common vision, the, the, the place of skilled conveners uh, was, was just a really essential place. As you think about replicating this wherever you are in, in the future, that we, we, were, we kept commenting on how, how that was just a really critical catalyst to making the process go well. Um, the, the establishment of common vision and shared values also was a, a, both a foundation as well as a glue along the way to keep people together. Um, for an initiative like this, over the course of time, there, there are all kinds of forces that tend to, to pull people apart. And, um, and what, what, what holds people together is, is a real sense of, of this must be done. We must accomplish this. As well as those shared values of what it is that is, um, is the basis and what, um, what, what we will keep focused on. So um, access, uh, equity, putting children at the center, um, those kinds of things that, were, that just were imbued throughout the whole process um, ended up helping it, it, it continue to go even during times when there were some bumps along the way and some challenges. And empower and mobilize the community by using the racial equity and social justice lens. To, um, it, it, was, it was helpful that, that this whole process was not just an initiative. It wasn't just a policy. It wasn't just a program, but it was, a, it was an issue of principle. And it was an issue of social virtue. So that, 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 that helped um, uh, empower and energize um, the, the, the process all along the way. There was, there was something bigger than just about getting a, a policy voted in. Um, it was, it was about, about, about communities thriving. And so those, those, those two principles are really critical. And then the engagement of experts from multiple sectors and disciplines. We were struck as well by, by um, time and again through the data by how cross-discipline and cross-sectoral conversations and alliances were really needed. It wasn't just, it could just be one person or one element of our communities that, that was moving this forward. It needed to be the coordination and cooperation of many and multiple sectors and disciplines to, to make this happen. So many more lessons, but those are some key ones. Looking in the future, of course, some of what was discovered was that this is just a first step to so much that is needed uh, needing to happen into the future. So the securing of funders, the elevation of quality of care, the meeting of infrastructure requirements, the steward, stewarding the pace of imp implementation, recognize it need to be phased in, ensuring public facing communication and accountability so this is not isolated, it's integrated within the community and sustainable over time. And that there are champions and leaders that would, that would arise from early childhood initiatives that would be able to, to, uh, to, to, to give light and illuminate the way forward. 
those are some, um, some brief highlights of this research. Uh, Lauren, let me um, turn this back over to you this time. Great, thank you, Steve, um, and to your team for all of your work, but sharing some of the key findings and insights today. So just one quick note to the audience, um, we will be taking questions shortly. So if some are starting to emerge, please uh, share them in the chat function. Um, but first, I am delighted to introduce uh, Lydia Gray Holyfield as a parent who has worked on this movement since day one, nearly 10 years ago. She was a representative um, of the Apparent Accountability Council to the task force. So welcome, Lydia. Nice to see you. Thank you so much, Lauren. I appreciate it. Um, thank you guys for um, allowing me a place to speak and to share my voice. Um, I represent the Parent Accountability Council, which is made up of six different communities. And in those communities, they have entrusted me to be their voice. The one thing that I would ask or that I would encourage you to do is to make sure you have a Parent Accountability Council if this is something that you're thinking about doing. The Parent Accountability Council has been the center of making these decisions. The beautiful part about this is that our voice mattered and that um, we got to share that voice, right? This is our vision that we wanted to come to fruition and now it has, and it's a beautiful thing um, that it has come to fruition. Um, one of our guiding principles in the parent accountability that to me has been at the forefront of all of this is nothing for us without us. And that's important to us. That was, that was one of our guiding principles because no decisions were made without the parent's voice being at the center. No, no decisions were made without us being able to come and sit at the table. If they asked a question, we brought, I brought it back to the Parent Accountability Council when we met and we decided together as a team. So I appreciate um, the opportunity to always represent them and to always make them proud because this is important. To have this happen in our county is, is history making, right? So this is going down in the history books as something positive with all the things that are happening right now in the world that's so negative when it comes to COVID. Having preschool for all for our kids is, is amazing. Our kids are all gonna be able to go to school at three and four year olds and be in classrooms that look like them, have their teachers look like them. That's the best part, right? Their teachers are gonna look like them. The language that they speak in their homes are gonna be spoken in their classrooms. <sighs> what else? Um, parents, teachers will have a livable wage. That's exciting. They can afford to actually take their own kids to school and not have to worry about, do I have to pay my rent or do I pay for childcare? So that's another great thing that, that I am so excited about and that I feel like this initiative really brought to fruition is making sure teachers and the TAs have a livable wage and making sure parents' voices heard when they walk in the classrooms. The parents and the teachers are gonna partner together to make sure the success of these children. One other thing that's so exciting is no child will be suspended or expelled from school. That is fabulous. Can you imagine? First of all, can you imagine a three and a four year old being expelled? That's insane, right? So we now make sure that we get the opportunity to make sure that that doesn't happen anymore because these kids deserve an education just like every all other children. Some children are a little bit more energetic. And so we're gonna provide training for those teachers and for those TAs to be able to partner with those parents to make sure that that child's future is insured and that child has an opportunity to grow and understand. And by partnering with those parents, the teachers and the skills um, that will be able to give, be given to the parents will be able to partner together to look at it and say, oh my goodness, let's get this wraparound service going around for this baby. Let's make sure that this baby has all the things that he or she needs and making sure that that parent voice is heard and not dismissing that parent or that child and seeing that they don't matter. Um, one of the other things, what else, what else, what else? I think that's about it. Um, I'm sorry, guys, I'm talking so fast. I'm a little nervous, um, but that's just me when, it, when I have to speak. Um, I'm trying to think. Is there anything? Okay. 
just again, if, if you are thinking about doing this in your county or in your state, please make sure you have parent voice at the center. Parent voice is so important because honestly, we know what we wanna see in our classroom. We know what we want for our kids. You know why we know that? Because we are our child's first teacher and we don't have to guess about that. We don't have to think about that. We know, because we've been doing this for a long time. And the other thing I can tell you is, take the parent's voice serious. Take the parent's voice into consideration. Don't just have a focus group and have them come to the focus group and then don't use what they're asking you for. That's not fair to them. Their time is valuable and they know what their kids want and they know what they want to see their children have. So I appreciate your time of allowing me to speak. And if you have any questions, I'll answer them. And again, thank you so much for allowing me to be here. Thank you, Lydia. I, we, are, we are so incredibly fortunate to have your wisdom, wisdom and expertise as a parent influencing uh, this entire process, but also for um, stepping up to, to share today. So thank you. Um, with that, we're going to shift to Q&A. So if you have questions, please um, paste them in the chat function. And any of the participants today, uh, so including our commissioner, uh, the dialogues and action team, uh, Lydia, as well as we have uh, two of the community-based interviewers on the call. If you have questions for any of them, um, please share. And I think I'll start us off um, a question here, uh, really for for anyone. But what are what are some decisions that were made, or parent perspective was most important? Do you want me to answer that, Lauren? That'd be great. Thanks, Lydia. Okay. Um, one of the things I can tell you that um, is about the wages for, for teachers and TAs. That was, that was one of the things I can think of. Um, yeah, that's, so, and the fact that no children will be suspended or expelled. So I can jump in, Miss Lydia, if you don't mind. I think there were very concrete things for me in terms of as we were creating this policy and as we were putting the campaign together where parent voice was absolutely essential. Um, one of those I think is as we're looking at the policy where we had of um, making sure that the program that we were putting in place would actually work for parents, right? That it wasn't just like the best of intentions, but in reality, when, it, when the rubber hit the road, like it wasn't gonna work. And I think one of those was when we were talking about um, the need for full day care, right? We knew that um, for all day, all day preschool was going to be a really important concept, but to make it work for parents, we were going to need to have to have before and after care for families that were also going to be affordable. And so we made the decision for to support families, um, you know, who were not able to afford it to also have um, not just free preschool during the day, but before and after care. Um, so that they would be able to use it and not have to worry about only having six hours of care for their kid and then and then having to go someplace else for after after work care or after school care that that actually doesn't work for families and so that was like a very concrete way where we heard loud and clear from families that 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 was needed that's great thank you commissioner uh so i have another question here um, that I think either Commissioner or Lydia, you might want to uh, sh uh, respond to, which is, can you share more about how the Parent Accountability Council is structured and staffed, including how parents are recruited to participate and supported in their leadership? Um. are made up of six different communities. We are chosen by um, our different agencies in which we represent at those, the six different communities. Um, in these communities, English is not always their first language. Sometimes it's like their fourth language. Um, we meet once a month which is phenomenal. We, when we were meeting in person, it was like 
everything in the world because um, we got to share different um, foods with each other. And um, one of the things when the parent accountability first started was we wanted to make sure that everyone at the table became family. So that's what we are. We're not just a council. Um, we consider each other family because we've all been together for so long. We've all been able to use our voice in such a way that um, we know and we respect each other. We know each other. We check on one another when something isn't right or we stand up for each other. And this isn't just our first. Um, the preschool for all was one of our initiatives, but we represent, we, we stand up for each other in all aspects, not just in just that aspect of preschool for all. When we came together and we first started talking about preschool for all, one of the things that I wanna share is that even though English isn't everyone's first language, we figured out that it was still the same language of us all wanting the same thing. We were all able to sit in a room and talk to each other and understand each one of us wanted the same thing when it came to preschool. We wanted our kids to go to school a quality place. Um, we wanted our kids to be put in the center. We wanted the classroom to look like our children. We wanted our children's voices to um, their language to be spoken in their classrooms. We wanted our voices as parents to be heard in the classroom. We wanted to be greeted by the teachers. That was one of the biggest things is when we walk in the classroom, say good morning to me. Say good morning, Miss Lydia. How's it going? You don't know what my day looked like before I got there. And just you greeting me, to just set my sparks in my brain, you know, to kick me back in gear of why I'm, you know, why I'm having a, you know, if I'm having a bad day, you just lit that fire that says your day is going to be fabulous. That's what we wanted. Like we wanted that piece of it. We also wanted, um, the parent accountability is, is family, right? We get to hang out with Miss Molly. We get to hang out with Miss Francis. We get to hang out with Miss Marietta and all the other people that represent us. We're a big family. We care about one another. Miss Molly um, and Francis and um, United Way, they, they come and they make sure we have a place to meet, but they allow us to be our authentic selves. They allow us to come into that room and unpack whatever it is we need to unpack. They give us the tools to be able to go out and speak. Um, what you guys don't know is I used to didn't speak in public. I would be terrified. Like I'd have anxiety the night before, freaking out. And um, honestly, Mark um, would stand next to me. I, I can, I always make this joke now when I have to speak in public is um, he would stand right by me in the beginning. And then he stood on the side, then he stood in the back and then he stood in the hallway, but he never left me. And that was so important to me because Mark allowed me to come out of my shell, but he also, they believed in me. And as a parent accountability counselor, to be able to go back to my, my sisters, because we're all women, unfortunately, we do want men, but they never show up. So that's not on us. That's, that's in the community thing. That's not a, it's not in, we didn't intentionally do it that way. But when I get to go back to my sisters and we get to talk, we have a good time, right? And I get to walk in that room and I get to say, you know what? Guess what we're doing next? Or here's where we are right now. And they're like, all right, Miss Lydia, yay, we did that or whatever. So this victory was, was huge for us, right? But I don't just represent myself. I represent five other communities that are important to me, that are my sisters and that are my family members and that we've grown together and that we're one big family and we have Molly and, and like I said, Miss Francis earlier, those are kind of like our um, big sisters, right? And they get to come in and they get to say, okay, you guys are doing a fabulous job or you know what you guys were going to take care of this. And anytime we went to Miss Molly or to Miss Francis and we said, this is what we want to work on. They said, okay, let's look into that and let's make that happen. And then they make it happen and they make it happen in such a way that it's seamless. We, we had some hiccups, but that's okay. Because, you know, with hiccups, you just drink a little bit of water or you get scared and you keep it moving. But, but we still were able to come out together, right? So the parent accountability is a family. It's not just a council. It's a family of sisters that get to come together and enjoy each other, but also make sure that the work in our communities are continually to move forward. 
Thanks so much, Lydia. That was really helpful. Um, I also want to invite, we do have, as you mentioned, Molly Day from Early Learning Multnomah um, United Way here with us today. So Molly, I don't know if there's anything you want to add around structure and staffing. Um, I know you posted your email. Thank you in the chat here. Um, and before that, I uh, want to add another question that was asked around the Parent Accountability Council, which is, uh, when setting up your voting structure, did you have any explicit methods to empower parents? Did the council itself have its own voice? Oh, these are really great questions. And Lydia, girl, thank you. We really are a great team as she described. I think that the Parent Accountability Council has been one of the sticky, juicy pieces of this process because all of us as policymakers and as philanthropists and system builders, we want parents at the center. We know we want that, we just don't always know how to do it. So um, I think one of the secrets of how the PAC is so successful is that we, as a, um, a state-funded initiative, partner with culturally specific organizations like Latino Network and SCI, and they identify the parent leaders, they bring them to the table, they staff them so that, um, I'm not picking who's at that table. I'm not determining who gets a vote. On the task force itself, the, um, the wonderful facilitators of that whole process were really great about building consensus as a decision-making tool. And, um, and Commissioner Vega Peterson and her team were really great about bringing information to the PAC to make determinations and to weigh in. But Brooke and other folks that were setting this process up, it was just this large iterative, um, um, consensus building process so that we didn't wait in a sense, have more heavily parent voice on the task force. We just gave them a very clear platform and regarded them not as both um, Petra and Lydia were on the task force and um, they were not just parents that we could acknowledge and set aside. They were key members of um, policymaking. They brought just expertise to the table, just like anybody else. And the way that that was set up and was continued, I think was out of just a real deep desire on the parts of the people on the task force to make sure that we did this right. And there was a clear understanding that to do policy right, you have to do it with people who are impacted at the table right alongside you. So that I think was like the secret sauce in a way. That's just my opinion, but um, it was such a pleasure to be a part of it. Thank you, Molly. Um, so I have another question here, and I'm wondering, Commissioner, if you might want to speak to this. Um, uh, Elizabeth is asking, can someone talk about how you attempt to protect infant and toddler care in this pre-case process? This is becoming an increasingly important issue in other communities around the country. Yeah, absolutely. And that, so I will say that this, um, this question of how do we make this huge investment and ask the community to make this huge investment in um, in preschool for all um, and no, and also like holding at the same time, knowing that we are not solving all of the problems across the continuum of childcare, right? That was something that we grappled with from the very first day of the task force. Um, we wanna, we are looking at how we can, we know the power of quality preschool. We know how important it is to center the, the, the children, the family, the workers as we were building this process. And also we weren't solving everything with with the financial, um, you know, pressures of childcare overall, and especially the, I mean, in Oregon, we have childcare deserts for infant and toddler care in every single county in the state, right? So we knew, we knew that we weren't gonna be able to affect that. What we wanted to do, and because we weren't the first jurisdiction to do this, we wanted to put um, a, a system in place, a policies in place that would prevent some of the um, detrimental effects on infant and toddler care that we had seen in other jurisdictions when they just implemented, um, universal uh, universal pre K. And so for one of the ways that we did that was um, making sure that from the start, we were gonna have a mixed delivery system. We weren't going to just be bumping out our public school system to have pre-K classrooms and then um, leave you know, a lot of the childcare providers and childcare centers that were depending on those three and four-year-olds to help fill up and balance out um, their, their cost flow um, to lose infant and toddler care spots. So that was, we also knew that families preferred, you know, um, some of the smaller providers, some of the um, licensed home-based providers, right? So we were really, we knew that it would be um, a harder and a bigger task to do that mixed delivery model, but that was something that we knew was important to really protect um, the, the child care workers, the child care providers, 
who are mostly women and, and disproportionately women of color, um, their jobs and their and, and their livelihoods. I think the other thing was looking at as we were growing our preschool for all programs, as we were having more um, preschool for all slots in these providers um, places, um, to incent them to keep preschool or grow to preschool for all slots, but not to lose any of the infant and toddler, the zero to three slots. And so having, as we were looking at how we were funding um, preschool for all slots, we, we set it up so that there would be different costs for a slot depending on what delivery system it was or what location it was. So like the least expensive slots were gonna be public school, um, but the more expensive slots were gonna be a, a preschool provider who also had zero to three care so that the, some of the balancing and stability funds for those zero to three sl slots would be built into the cost there as well. Great, thank you. Uh, so one other question here, um, and I think Commissioner or Molly, um, you may have perspective on this as well as the Dialogues and Action team, um, but what is, I think thinking about conditions for success. And so um, given perspective around Multnomah County and where it sits relative to, you know, this in the state of Oregon. So what, what is unique about Multnomah County and kind of how or why did this universal preschool model happen here first? So I can, I can take a crack at that and then I'd love to hear from other voices on what they think. Um, you know, for me, I will say, um, I think a huge thing um, here, well, I, okay, I'll just start off by saying, I think a huge thing is that we had Mark Holloway here, um, who was such a huge champion of this work. Uh, Mark Holloway is on the call, hello. Um, and uh, Mark was a huge driver and, um, and leader in this work from, from when it started 10 years ago when social venture partners first were convening some community conversations about what did the community need in terms of, um, in terms of quality preschool and who were those, um, those populations, those priority populations who were having the hardest time accessing preschool and, and then has continued to push this work forward to this very day with this very report. So just huge thank yous to Mark for his leadership and his real like um, incredible values of, of um, prioritizing community voice and how it had to happen. So I think having that kind of um, focused, committed leadership um, was huge. And I think social venture partners played a great role in bringing together the public and the private in terms of the, the conversations with community to get to that or to get to those early reports. And then, you know, I think that um, I was, this was something that was very serendipitous, but I had worked um, as a state legislature before I became a county commissioner and, and was passionate about preschool as well. So when I came over to the county, it was perfect timing because this was an issue I wanted to work on and they were looking for somebody who could be a political champion um, of, a, of a preschool program like this. And so that fit really well. So having a political champion, I think is a key piece to the success of this kind of work. Um, and then I think that we were able to, like, again, listen to community voice and, and, and the Parent Advisory um, Accountability Council, of course, but also the broad table and folks who were there at the, um, at the Preschool for All Task Force table and um, the really deep work that went on, not at just that table, but at also the subcommittees that were there. So we, we were able to build a really robust policy. And then we had the work of Universal Preschool Now, who was working in a parallel track to really build a grassroots um, awareness and, and grassroots demand for this kind of action. And so that when we, we were able to get to the point of putting it on the ballot, we had a very broad coalition and a broad base of support for this, um, for this kind of investment. And, you know, and so I think all of that, you know, came together. And I will say for the tax mechanism that we selected for Preschool for All, which is a, a tax on higher income earners, um, I think that is something that's very unique because Multnomah County has a very, um, a very progressive um, voter base. And so for us, this was the right revenue mechanism. And as I talk about Preschool for All around the country, I say, this is what worked for us, not just our policies, but also the, the way we paid for it works for Multnomah County. You need to talk and talk to the people in, um, in your community about what does this look like the right, you know, the right fit for you. So I think those are the things that I would say. And again, as we're looking at doing something like this nationally, you know, I think we also need to, you know, just really use as many voices as we can to talk about the need for this. Um, I know, you know, in some places I've talked to, they're like, actually, like, 
public safety is a huge voice because they know that this kind of investment in quality um, education and preschool is a great, you know, is a is something that they want to see happen. Or business is really driving this. That's happened in jurisdictions we look to. So, to, so find out what's the right magic for your community and go and go with that. Great, thank you. I'm wondering, anyone else, any of the other participants want to add to that? The data from the research certainly supports what Commissioner Vega Peterson says about all, all of those aspects. In addition to that, we heard from the interviews that uh, people kept talking about how this was not the start of community involvement. And it wasn't the beginning of community voice. And it, it wasn't, wasn't the, you know, the, the, the early steps of parent um, uh, engagement, that, that there had, had, had been some years of momentum building prior to this. Which, which really speaks to the place of funders and the county and, um, and, and culturally specific organizations and other CBOs that have just been, been working at community engagement for years prior to this. And then, and then there, was, there was kind of a ripeness of time that, that, that uh, where the momentum was able to be capitalized to move in this direction. Thank you, Steve. Well, I know we're coming up on the hour here. Um, so I want to, I thought we thought we might end looking forward since we've been reflecting back on the process. We're fortunate to have here on the call today, um, Leslie Barnes, who is the new uh, director of Preschool for All, our initial director of Preschool for All. And we are absolutely thrilled and just incredibly fortunate here in Multnomah County to have Leslie stepping up into this leadership role. But Leslie, I'm wondering if I might invite you into the conversation and just in a, in a minute, um, share what you're most excited about or looking forward to as we move towards implementation. Hi, thank you. Um, I'm looking forward to all of it lots of really innovative problem solving, building out an amazing team here at the county and making sure that we continue to talk to parents so that we know we're going in the right direction, talking to the providers who are providing preschool to make sure we don't need to correct things there. But I'm looking forward to all of it. There's a lot of problems to solve, a lot of great solutions and creative thinking. COVID is still in the mix, right? So how do we think about how our plans might change based on that? So all the things are great. And again, it's just positive thinking, great problem solving, and looking forward to kids on carpets in 2022. So yeah, got a big grin on my face and uh, really excited about the work. Great. Thank you, Leslie. Um, well, I also just want to close by saying thank you all for your interest in learning about uh, more about our, our work here in Multnomah County. So thank you for joining us today. If you have questions, you're welcome to contact um, the Dialogues and Action Research Team um, directly about the research or Commissioner uh, uh, Jessica Vigo peterson and her team about the policy development and campaign. So with that, thank you for joining us and hope you have a great rest of your afternoon.